Hello everyone, my name is Javier Ortiz. I am, your, I am your mentor throughout this program, Data Engineering from Udacity. So I hope you, that, you have, that you're having a great week, that you're learning a lot, and you're having success turning in your projects. So before we begin, some reminders. Uh, don't forget to check our Slack channel, d, d Session 963. This is where a study group resides. Each week on Tuesday, I'm posting a weekly roundup where you have all the lessons you have to cover during that week, any schedule events such as this webinar, and the link to schedule a one-on-one -on -one mentor meeting with me, uh, along with some deliverables. For example, this previous week, or this week, starting on Tuesday, um, was a due date for Project Data Warehouse. All right. Now, with that being said, um, before beginning this, this week's um, topic, which is Intro to Spark, let me walk you through, give you an overview of what this unit, what you can expect from this unit. So, um, this unit it will be covering... Um, Data lakes with Spark, right? And all right, here it is. So uh, it consists of four different lessons. The first one being data lakes with Spark, the power Spark. It will take you about an hour and a half to to do that. So we're scheduling one or two days to to finish that. Then data lake with Spark, data wrangling with Spark. That takes about two hours to finish that lesson, so you can schedule about two, three days to finish that. Debugging optimization, it's a small lesson, so that's about an hour, hour and a half. So one or two days is fine. And introduction to data lakes, which is, should take you about one hour and a half, maybe two hours. So all in all, you can finish all the lessons uh, during this week, which should take you about four to seven days to finish that. So we're looking at um, next Wednesday or Thursday, you could be starting working on the project, okay? So that will give you a good two weeks and a half to, um, to turn in the project, which I think is a fair enough amount of time. Uh, after that, you have the data lakes with Spark project, optimize your GitHub profile. So that's a quick one to be done in, in an hour or two. All right, with that being said, let's move on to today's topic, which is intro, intro to Spark. Okay. So what we'll be covering in this presentation is, first of all, what is big data? Uh, how are overview numbers everyone should know? parallel computing versus distributed computing, map reduce, and when should you use Spark? Great, so what is big data? Now, um, big data has become this, this, this fancy term, um, but we really don't know how to define it many times. We, we think we're working with big data because we have a large data set, and it's not always the case. Uh, but yes, um, you need a large amount of data. If you're working with some couple of megabytes, uh, maybe a gig or two, I mean, you don't have that big of a data set. But if you, you have a large, large amounts of data, then it might be worth to consider big data. But the main, main thing that will let you know if you're working with big data or not if, if the data you're working with is easier to work with multiple computers than in your own machine, all right? Um, and in order to understand this definition better, we, know to know, we need to know modern hardware capabilities, all right? Because if we understand how fast can your own machine perform certain operations versus how fast can can, can, how fast can it be to send this data, share it with other computers so that each computer processes part of it? If you can compare these two, 
then you will take a an informed decision that if you're working with big data or not. But basically, this is the definition you want to work with. If it's easier to work with multiple computers than in your own machine, you are working with big data. All right, so let's move on to hardware capabilities. So we're going to focus on four main parts of the computer, which are like the, the, the basic building blocks. Uh, we start with the CPU, which stands for Central Processing Unit. The CPU is the brain of the computer. Uh, it handles all the math, it handles all the operations. It's, it's basically the one that does the work of processing stuff, of, of um, yes, of dealing, dealing with stuff. And it is the fastest. It, it is the one that, that executes, executes the fastest, right? And you should find in your computer uh, in the processors that uh, you have a dual core processor or Intel processor. That's, that's the CPU. After that, we move on to the memory, which this is the RAM, random access memory. And this is a temporary storage. Basically, it holds the, any data, any information that you might need, that you have used during that specific session, the computer thinks that you might use it. And it also helps to uh, bring data to the CPU for the CPU to process. So this, this helps with that. After that, we have the storage, which nowadays is the SSD, but before that was a magnetic disk. And this storage is used for keeping data over longer periods of time. So the memory might, might give some data to the CPU and the CPU might decide to write that data, store it uh, for long periods of time. So when you end your session or you turn off the computer, anything that you had holding, uh, that, that you've been holding here will be saved uh, for long, um, long periods of time in the storage because the memory, the random, the, the, uh, RAM, this memory, when you turn off your computer, when you close your session, this memory is gone. All right, and this is the second fastest, this is the third one. And finally, we get the slowest one, which is network. It can be a local access network or it can be something worldwide as the internet. And the network could connect to other computers in the same room. That's the definition of a local area network uh, by a cable or, or just in the same setup, the same network or on the other side of the world connected over the internet. And this is as low as because it, it, it has um, information is to travel a, a longer route, All right? So this four main parts of the computer and we have, we have them in order of fastest to slowest. Great, so what are the numbers that everyone should know? So a CPU operation, basically executing anything with the CPU, takes about 0.4 nanoseconds, all right? So that's like super, super, extremely fast. And after that, the memory reference, that's from RAM, RAM memory, it lasts, it takes 100 nanoseconds. So it takes it's, um, like 200 times more than the CPU operation. Then we have the random read from the SSD. It takes 60 microseconds. And we have a round trip from data, for data from the uh, European Union to the US, that's 150 milliseconds. So it's important that we understand these numbers because these numbers will let you know um, where is the bottleneck of, if you're, if you're struggling to process data, um, is because you have one of these bottlenecks and one of these is, is struggling with, with the data. And you need to refer to these numbers along with the capacities of each of this. So for example, my memory effort is my RAM memory. I only have eight gigs and, and I'm using those eight gigs um, just to transfer data from the SSD to the CPU, my bottleneck is over here. And I can decide to better use 
uh, a network to, to process um, my data with multiple computers, right? So this will let you know just have an average how much time it takes for um, each operation that the computer performs, right? Now this arrives to parallel computer versus distributed computer. So you have decided that you need more power. The, the, the operations, as fast as the CPU is taking them and the RAM is taking, giving instructions to the CPU uh, or taking data to the CPU, um, you've decided that, that you need um, extra power. So you have two options, parallel computing versus distributed computing. Parallel computing implies multiple CPUs share the same memory. For example, right now I'm, I'm using a dual core, which is a type of processor that has two CPUs, all right? But since I'm using the same machine, I only have one RAM memory. And this RAM memory, basically what it does, it distributes the, um, the, the data that we're, I'm, I'm processing into these two CPUs. So, even that that might that that is going to make all the processes from the CPUs faster because I have two CPUs working that. But if, if my data of whatever I'm working with exceeds my random access memory, my RAM my RAM memory capacity, this won't matter because the problem won't be in the CPUs, the problem will be in the RAM memory. But it still, it's really useful to have these two CPUs, right? So that's parallel computing. But as I mentioned, if I have a, the trouble with, with the same, with the RAM memory, then it's time to move on to distributed computer, where each CPU has its own memory. And you can think of that, uh, you can think of it as computers connected, right? And each computer um, taking part of the problem and processing it by itself. Uh, so each computer machine is connected to the others to the other machines across the network. So you definitely need a network, and mm, the network is the slowest one. But since you're working with such a big data that basically mm, basically it overwhelms your RAM memory or your SSD storage, your long-term storage then it is worth uh, undergoing a slower processor, uh, process in order for each CPU and, and RAM memory to, to hand, being able of handling a smaller uh, packet or a smaller data set. All right, so that arrives to, that, 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 that leads us to map reduced. So because basically Spark is, is uh, it's a way of handling distributed computing, all right? And one of the best way of understanding how distributed computer, computing works is by this method, which is MapReduce, or right? this technique, which is MapReduce, which is a programming technique for manipulating large data sets, all right? So Spark helps us manipulate um, big data sets uh, through a distributed computing, and map reduces one of these programming techniques. All right, so it consists of three main parts. We have the map part, the shuffle, and the reduce. The map, in, in the map part of the process, data is divided across the different machines, and each partition is analyzed and converted into a key value pair. So basically, the first thing you do is you distribute the data across different machines. And then you analyze each partition, and each machine analyzes its own partition and it converts the data into a key value, right? So it establishes a key and it gives a value to that key. After that, um, the, the different partitions communicate again and pairs with the same key end up in the same machine. So one machine says, I'm going to take all of these keys and I'm going to give all of the other keys that don't fit this category to this other machine that is going to handle only those, only that key, and yet another computer can handle just another key. And finally, we have reduce, where the values for each key can be combined to count them or to perform any sort of operation that, that you need. 
And here's a, a visual example. As you can see, here we have our large data set, okay? And uh, we've, we've, uh, we've arrived into the conclusion that uh, it, it would be faster to work with distributed computer. So the first thing we do is we partition that data, right? And when we partition that data, uh, we, we give it to each machine and the machine is going to analyze it and convert it to a key and a value. So this computer receives this partition and analyzes and said, okay, X is a key and I'm going to give it the value of one. B is a key, I'm going to give the value of one, and this another B is another key, I'm giving the value of one. And each computer performs the same analysis. So we end up with this key value pairs. After that, we go to the shuffle part. And the shuffle part, what we do, is, or the computer does, is all the same keys, all identical keys are, are shuffled or taken into uh, a one machine that is going to handle all the same the same type of keys. So, for example, here in the first machine, all the A ones, all the A's are taken to the first machine. All the B's are taken to the second machine. All the C's are taken to the third machine. All the X's into the fourth machine. And after that, each machine can um, can perform operations in this in specific data, which is all the same. So it's really really quick. Uh, to work with that um, and and counts them. So I have an A value one. I'm going. To, I know we have the same key, so I'm going to add the values. So I have arrived to A equal two, B three, C two, and X two, and that is the reduce part. So as you can see, this this basically splits the data, shuffles it, and then you can perform operations for it. And that's why it's really useful for. ETL processes because as you can see this can be think of as an extraction and then you transform the data and then you can load it a certain way so that's why spark is really useful for ETL processes now training machine learning models is another great use of spark because you are once again going over and over uh, data basically feeding the data to the, to the model the streaming is another great example of when to use Spark. And some of the main difference between Spark and Hadoop, Hadoop is a, it's another um, distributed computing um, system, um, but it's an older one. And, and Spark is faster because it keeps data in the memory, in the RAM memory. So as, as you remember, RAM memory processes are faster. And instead of reading from the storage, the long-term storage, we're reading from the memory. And, but that itself means that Spark is not a data storage system, all right? So we need to think of it not as a data storage system, so you will need to store your data eventually somewhere, but just as a place to um, transform the data and, 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 and process it in some way. So hopefully that will give you a better idea of what is a Spark, when to use a Spark, and why it will be so useful for working with big, 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 big amounts of data. Uh, so far, you, you, have, you know, you have understood how to work with relational databases, with NoSQL databases, and, and, and how, to connect, how to create data warehouses. Uh, but sometimes the data that you receive is so, so big that you need to work with a, 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 a system such as Spark. All right, so that is today's webinar. And I, I hope that you have learned something from it. Once again, don't hesitate to ask for help. That's what the... Uh, forum is for that's what slack is for and don't forget to use a student hub as well use all the resources that udacity has made available for you guys and don't forget to schedule the one-on-one -on -one calls uh, it's super easy it, it, just to remind you uh, you just click here in this link canonly.com slash Javier Mortiz you click here in one-on-one -on -one mentor meetings and 
you move on to the next month and I have, and you can see I have all of the, I have basically every day available except for Sundays. So I have this, this spots on Friday, on Monday, I'm sorry. I have more spots on Saturday. So, and you can schedule with, um, the whole month is already open. So um, schedule at your convenience and don't forget to keep on progressing with your lessons and the projects. So that is it. And once again, thank you very much and we'll be in touch. Have a great week. Weekend now. <laughs> Bye-bye.